This podcast is brought to you by the Resolve Long Horizon Investing Masterclass, a 10-part evergreen podcast series where Adam Butler, Mike Philbrick, and Rodrigo Gordillo of Resolve Asset Management Global explore an advanced investment framework specifically designed to steward quasi-permanent capital with humility and balance. From the science of decision-making to all-weather portfolio construction to the value of diversified alpha and tail protection, this series provides a comprehensive capital management roadmap to improve outcomes for wealthy individuals, advisors, family offices, and institutions managing less than $10 billion. To listen to the series or read the transcripts on demand, please visit investresolve.com forward slash masterclass. Alternatively, you can find it on your favorite podcast player by searching for resolve dash masterclass. All right. Well, 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 look at that. Shazam. <laughs> what a last great minute. group of individuals we have. Yes, indeed. All right, Not Mike, why don't you go Jason. ahead and introduce everybody? Cheers to another happy Friday afternoon. Cheers. We've got um, Cheers. a couple of special guests here. And I will just remind everybody that nothing here is investment advice. If you're looking for an investment advice show, you probably shouldn't be watching YouTube on happy hour, four o'clock on a Friday. <laughs> so we're going to talk about lots of stuff today. It's going to be about wine. Wine is an investment, investable wine. What is it? Futures, all that good fun stuff. And we've got uh, a tool 20 from wine cult here. And, and we've got Jason Buck, who is a wine connoisseur as well as a hedge fund manager. So, Guest hosting this uh, show is going to be, uh, I think, awesome for you, Jason. Thanks for joining us. Yeah. And did you do your prep, all the prep that I gave you for the call? Yeah. Rodrigo let me know eight minutes before that you guys are going <laughs> on. But, uh, <laughs> I, but thankfully, I don't have to do much prep as I live in Napa Valley, California, and my girlfriend's a sommelier. We should have probably had her on instead of me, but I could be a wino with the rest of you guys. Lovely. There we go. So we, uh, we had. Say again, a tool? I was saying eight minutes, just enough time to open a bottle. Exactly. <laughs> we had our, Adam was going to join us, but he woke up with a random uh, like body ache, back ache. Turns out he's got two fractured ribs. He has no idea how he got it. Butler's the type of guy that might get it from just walking, right? Like I, yeah, I kind of feel exactly. like that, that's, 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 that's his pebble. style. He stepped on a pebble. The great thing at tool for Jason is that he's in California, so it's actually one o'clock for him. <laughs> And although it was eight minutes to get to the call, he's just drinking a continuation of what he was having with lunch, I'm assuming. Perfect. Well, exactly. you live in Napa, you've got to, you know, you've got to do that. That's <laughs> Exactly. It's a, it's a forced lifestyle choice. It's uh, that's that's my excuse is it's just I, I'm when in Rome. Love it. All right, Mike's frozen. So out of the people in this podcast, I am the one with the least amount of knowledge in wines. So I am going to uh, kind of let you guys go and I'll pipe in with some uh, novice questions whenever I can. But Atul, why don't we begin with uh, you giving us a little bit of your background, um, which I think is, is kind of fascinating for the world to hear. Uh, I know we did this already for the Canadian audience, but this is, this is now worldwide. Tell us your tale. Great, fantastic! Thanks, uh, thanks for having me on on the riffs. Um, I'm looking forward to uh, to the to our chat. So, um, yeah. So my name's uh, Atul Tiwari. Um, I uh, I'm a, a reformed lawyer, as uh, as, as uh, Rodrigo knows from the last time I, I talked about my past. Um, I moved into the asset management world, um, working for a Canadian uh, bank, global financial institution called BMO, and um, Spent a couple years uh, running the U.S. mutual fund business for BMO. Um, after BMO, I went on to uh, be hired to start up Vanguard Investments in Canada. So I was the CEO for Vanguard, um, and uh, that was about a seven and a half year uh, run. A lot of fun. Um, and after Vanguard, I was looking to do something a little bit different. So uh, I was always interested in wine, and I knew that there was uh, uh, a popular culture, let's call it, of uh, wine investing in Europe and in Asia. And I always wondered why 
has this never happened in North America to any large degree. Um, and so I put together a business plan, uh, reached out to, uh, for my research, who I thought was the, the best at this in the world, and that's Cult Wines in, uh, in the UK. Um, Cult was established in 2007 uh, by Tom Gearing, who's our global CEO, uh, and his father, <clears throat> excuse me, and um, has a 13-year track record that we can point to in performance. Um, we manage uh, about 300 million, that's Canadian dollars, uh, in assets uh, globally. And uh, what we do is we provide um, a portfolio of uh, fine wine that we'll manage for you actively. Um, and so that's, uh, that's what we're doing. We launched in Canada in April um, and it's been uh, uh, well received so far. It's a good time for real assets. And we uh, actually opened a New York City office uh, just prior to, to COVID and um, basically have relaunched that at the same time as uh, we launched Canada. Uh, so that's, uh, that's me in a nutshell. Now, this isn't um, a fun structure or anything like like How, how is it that you, you think about providing access to, to this unique asset class? Right. Yeah, it's not an investment fund. So basically, as a client, uh, when you onboard, you know, we'll do your risk profiling. We'll we'll talk to you about your objectives, your duration of investment, um, and then what happens is we we buy the wine for you. So we acquire it, um, we store it in professional storage in the UK, um, we insure it, we make sure that uh, when it's transported, it's done without any vibrations or you know at, at the right temperature, et cetera, et cetera. So. Basically, um, it's your wine. You own it. Uh, you can decide whether you want us to to manage it, and at some point, sell, and you can take proceeds or reinvest them. Or um, some of our clients decide, "Hey, this is great wine. Uh, I'm just going to pull it out and I'll enjoy it. Uh, you know, um, consume it and enjoy it." So that's uh, that's the way it works. The terrible investment. You're just going to drink. <laughs> He's going to drink millions away. That's kind of crazy. So, you know, there's, as I get into this space, I, as I mentioned, I'm not the one kind of sir, but as you get into this space, you start realizing that there are a few voices out there that carry a lot of weight in terms of the type of sales that one would expect based on the blessing of one individual, one group giving you ratings or another. How does that world? Can you can you give us some insight as to how that the world of ratings and and um, and magazines play into the prices of wine and, and trying to find good wines? Sure. Yeah. Absolutely. So up until uh, a few years ago, uh, there was one person who essentially moved uh, global markets with um, with ratings, and that was Robert Parker, who um, a lot of people have probably heard of or uh, come across his um, his his um, reviews. And it, it was amazing. I mean, he had so much power and influence. Um, you know, you think of, uh, uh, I always kind of think about, you know, sports or um, musicians and you kind of go like, who is the one person who, you know, kind of dominates? Um, and every now and then you might have somebody, you know, like uh, Tiger Woods in his heyday or what have you in golf. Um, but Mr. Parker, you know, essentially since uh, the early 80s until a few years ago, held that held that uh, position. Um, he retired and, and sold um, his business. And so now um, what's happened is <clears throat> there's a, a number of influential critics now around the world. Um, and some of them have carved out niches where you'll have, uh, and in, in California, maybe Jason will know, there's Alan Meadows who... Um, uh, is called the Berg Hound, and, and he's an expert in Burgundy. Um, and, and there's um, great critics uh, in, in Italy that are experts in Italian wine. So it's kind of neat to see what's happening. And from an investment perspective, you know, we need to follow all of them now. It's not just one person. Um, so it's become a little more complex, but uh, it's democratized. So it, it, it's kind of, it's good. Um, and, and basically, uh, we, we, we keep an eye on critics' ratings of the vintage and then critics' ratings of each of the, the wines in the barrel. Uh, 
and then all the critics re-rate once the, the wine's in the bottle. Um, and then they'll schedule future ratings where they'll open the bottle and, and try and see how it's, how it's doing. So um, one of the many inputs in our investment process is exactly that, which is tracking ratings and um, um, uh, anticipating perhaps if an influential critic is going to raise a rating, obviously demand increases for that wine and the prices go up. So that's that's part of what we do. Can you tell me, like Rodrigo is asking functionally, right? It's not an investment fund. You're giving them advice and you're basically buying and storing the wines properly for them. But I assume they're coming to you because they want actual investment advice about what they're buying. So is that primarily what you're offering is like, look, we're we're buying these first growth Bordeaux and are, are you buying the futures as part of the acquisition process? Like how do you give advice to the clients for building out a proper seller? Right, yeah. So um, again, it starts with understanding the client's objectives. And so for example, if you're um, you know balanced uh, and you're looking for a, um, a balanced approach, then we'll tailor the, um, the, the portfolio in a way that, you know, quite likely will include, as you say, you know, first growth Bordeaux that, that's reasonably conservative. You know, you have a reasonable idea of return there. Um, and uh, so long as, you know, we've done our work on vintages and if you can acquire it at, at a reasonable price, then that would make sense. Um, if you come uh, to us and say, look, I'm a growth investor in wine. I want to, you know, I, I'll, I'll take the risk and I want to kind of try to shoot the lights out, if you will. Um, that's fine. And in that case, you know, we'd look at other uh, potential uh, avenues for you to do that, which would be, you know, uh, if it's Burgundy, sort of up and coming producers that we know are great winemakers and they're starting to get acclaim. So, you know, that that's a, that's a, a pretty good bet, if you will, for growth. Um, and then we'll look at uh, potentially other regions. And we, we talked about this in the uh, last time Roger and uh, Mike and I were chatting was uh, some of the wine producing regions like Chile and Argentina um, have some iconic wines that uh, are now sort of getting more international acclaim and therefore prices are rising there as well. So you, can, you kind of think of that maybe as an emerging market um, sleeve in your, in your portfolio. I was thinking, we, like, somebody, go ahead, Mike. Go ahead. I was just wondering, did we talk a little bit about the own premier or the wine futures and how they work yet? Or not have you guys yet. covered that? Okay, well, continue on. I just want to make sure we sure. cover that off. Go ahead. Jason. Yeah, yeah, Jason, I guess you did ask about futures. So um, the answer is yes, we do um, participate in the uh, futures programs. Uh, mainly the biggest one is Bordeaux. Um, and uh, basically... Uh, what we do, we do our homework beforehand on the vintage uh, because uh, for those who don't know, um, uh, futures are essentially when you buy wine that's still in the barrel. So it hasn't been bottled yet. And basically you hold that contract for two years until you get physical delivery of the wine in the bottle. Um, so that said, you know, we have to do our homework on the vintage, understand um, which regions uh, within Bordeaux, you know, might do better than others. And then uh, it, there's a bit of art and science then to um, determine when the, when the producers do release their futures, are they priced reasonably? Um, and so you have to take it by pro producer by producer, because if you look at this year, for example, um, the first producer to release their futures was Chateau Angelus, um, and they released at just a few percent higher than last year's price. So everyone went, wow, that's amazing, because last year prices were down because COVID had basically struck and people just didn't know where, where the wine market was going to go. Um, so we kind, of, we kind of got excited. We said, whoa, this is awesome. Um, and then as the campaign kind of went on, more producers released at higher prices. Um, and then we had to say, well, maybe, you know, maybe some of these other names aren't appropriate because they're pricing too high. So in the end, um, we likely didn't buy as much Bordeaux as we thought we would. Um, and instead, what we did was we focused on a couple of back vintages where wines were available um, because we thought for clients that's a better buy. And when you look at what's happening in 2021 in France, unfortunately with the frosts, um, 
production is way down in Bordeaux and Burgundy. So we, we think these back vintages will also appreciate because uh, because of scarcity in in the uh, in the vintage that we're seeing this year. So can I can I just understand? Uh, just sorry, this from a futures contract. We deal with a certain type of futures, financial futures contract. How do how do wine futures differ from the traditional um, Main Street futures markets? How yeah, so work? wine future isn't a securities uh, commodity contract. It's not a commodity futures contract. So when we say futures in the wine world, it's it's really you bought the wine and you're just you're going to get it in two years sort of thing. Um, we don't make markets in futures contracts. So when when clients buy in the um, uh, the own premier, as it's called, the, the futures market, essentially what they're doing is they're buying they're buying the wine. It'll sit in their account for two years. We'll take delivery in Bordeaux transport it to our um, storage in in the UK and, and then it's you know it's physically in your um, in your possession or in your uh, in your account and then rod maybe I'll uh, I'll try to simplify and Atul can correct me but what's interesting is like they're probably watching the climactic conditions going into this year's harvest this is what a tool and the team are doing right and they're right. predicting based on historical precedences is, mm -hmm. is this likely to be a good vintage let's say in Bordeaux right? The vintage happens, they, you know, they press the wine, um, they're putting it in the barrel. At that time, these trusted palates like the Robert Parkers are now the new, new, new breed in the world. They're tasting it right then before it's aged at all and going, I think this is gonna be a great vintage. So you're getting that, the hubris of their, their palates in, in aggregate saying, this is gonna be a great vintage. So then they're taking that into account. But then you're waiting two years for that wine to come out of barrel and into bottle. And at that point, everybody's gonna retaste it and they may decide, this is a better or worse vintage than we thought previously. But then it gets more complicated than that. You need it to age, right? So five yeah. years hence, you're like, this vintage was underrated. Now we feel it's overrated. Or you're waiting 20 years after that, and this is where you can find gems. So it's really the alpha is a, a tool and his team assessing it at every step of this process and finding where they think there's maybe underpriced or overpriced vintages based on historical precedents and how they view it versus how the the palates of the world view it. Is That's that fair? So, so, so is that yeah. well said? Are you you said you don't trade in in the futures contracts? A few steps. I think you meant you rattled off like twenty seven steps. But in the beginning, <laughs> there was um, before it's pressed, and then when it's pressed, and before it goes to bottling. Are you able to liquidate your futures positions before the bottling? And I guess you the liberty. Technically could. <clears throat> you technically could. Um, we don't encourage it. Uh, when we talk to investors, we do, you know, specify that you really should think of a three to five year duration for each holding, and and ideally a minimum of five years. Uh, and, and basically, that's because you want to give the wine an opportunity to appreciate and value. Um, and and in the early years, uh, it will start appreciating. And then it plateaus for a bit, and then demand and consumption increases, and then it'll it'll take another. Generally speaking, it'll take another, you know, rise in price, and and then plateau again for a little while. So, um, yeah, we wouldn't we wouldn't encourage it. I think if if you're a client, and let's just say you had to liquidate your investments, we would find a way to sell the uh, the contract. Um, but uh, but that said, uh, I I don't know. I don't know that we ever actually have, um, but but it's theoretically possible. And how big is the futures market in wines, dollar oh, wise? Um, you know, I, I'm not I'm not sure. I, I'm not sure what the actual amount would be. Um, but I'll say, you know, Bordeaux is the biggest region doing it. Burgundy does a very little bit of it, but not much. Um, so it really is a Bordeaux futures market. Um, but what's interesting, there are a couple of things that are interesting there, which is um, some producers recently have decided to not issue futures. Um, and they've said, you know, we're not going to be part of this uh, old structure anymore. Um, and one of the famous first growths of Bordeaux, Chateau Latour, uh, is an example of that, where they're just, they say, look, we're just going to hold our wines till they're ready and then we'll release them at the prices we think that they should uh, command at that time. Um, the other thing, smart. Have, guess, yeah, it is smart it's interesting. Maybe already. <laughs> they can fund yeah. their like, inventory, obviously. Yeah, the, well, they can afford to, yeah. <laughs> uh, for sure. Uh, but, uh, you know, the other interesting thing is um, that we're seeing more of as well is 
it's really hard to determine exactly um, how many cases and bottles each producer has produced. You, you, there's a kind of a run rate and you can guess, um, but based again, as, as Jason said, based on the climate and what happened, you, you try to figure out what their production was because a number of producers are now releasing only some of their inventory into um, the futures market. So to Jason's point, you know, maybe they need some cash flow, but they don't need to sell their whole production. So they're going to get some cash flow and then they're going to hang on to, to the others, hoping that the price is going to appreciate. And then when they release it, it'll, it'll be at a higher price for them, right? As the producer. Yeah, Rodrigo, they want to obfuscate that as much as possible, right? Because that's the idea of cult wines. It's like, for me, like a cult wine would maybe be 500 cases produced, where you'd be shocked that some of these first growth Bordeaux, so they're supposed to be cult wines, but they're producing like 25 to 50,000 cases. So it behooves right. them to kind of ratchet that expectation down of, of, of scarcity. So that's that part of the process as well. And I told it's been years since I've looked at it, but I think if you really want to get a picture for the futures market, it's like LiveX and maybe other platforms mm -hmm. that, that have like a liquid options trading platform, I mean, platform for the futures contracts where you could kind of assess prices in real time. Is that is that maybe the best way to see where it's at? Yeah, that's a very good. Um, you, you clearly have a lot of knowledge of the wine market, um, but uh, <laughs> uh, absolutely. LiveX um, is the stock exchange for wine and it's based in London because um, you know, I think a third of the global trade of um, a fine wine goes through London traditionally. So LiveX was started in, I think, the year 2000. Um, globally, there's over 500 participants in the stock exchange or the wine exchange, let's call it. Um, and you have to be a professional. In other words, a merchant uh, or an investment firm like us. Um, you can't join as a private individual. So... Um, you know, basically you've got the professionals, let's call it, around the world who are buying and selling these fine wines and trading them daily. So you've got a market. Um, and that that was important to me as a, as a reform lawyer um, when I was looking into this uh, and setting up the joint venture with, with Cult Wines was one of the things with Alt Investments, obviously, is, you know, you want to make sure that there's an ability to uh, properly price the uh, um, the assets. And in this case, it's wonderful because you've got a third party um, exchange pricing daily. So as a client, when you sign into your account, uh, we will update your positions daily based on the, the LiveX feed. And so one of the questions out there was, do you fully pay up the futures or can you just partially collateralize them? Um, in, in in our case, we we have them fully paid up, um, but other uh, other offerers, let's say, of um, futures may just require deposits. So, in Ontario, and Jason, I don't know uh, if you're familiar with uh, Canada much at all, but um, we we have a very strict regulatory regime when it comes to alcohol, <laughs> and um, uh, in Ontario. Um, uh, we have a, a body called the LCBO. And so uh, LCBO will sell futures to Ontario residents. And I believe they they ask for, I think it's 50% down. And then when the wine comes in, you, you pay the other 50%. Um, so merchants could choose to do that. Yeah, we have, a, we as you know, we have the same uh, Byzantine uh, regulatory standards with our three-tier system that actually comes out of Tide House, which is from prohibition. We're still working with a hundred year old laws here and we're trying to like distribute alcohol throughout the country within that system. And so as you imagine, it, it, it has a lot of the rentier class in there taking their cuts and it, it serves very similar in Canada. I was thinking about if I come to you, let's just say uh, hypothetically, I come to you as a blank slate and I'm like, I want to create a, a million dollar wine portfolio. And you know, we're thinking as in general terms, as all of us think is portfolio allocation. And basically you have your, your blue chips, well-known system with first growth Bordeaux. Like you said, you got your emerging markets, whether it's Australia, Chile, Argentina. And then in between though, you also have Burgundy, but Burgundy is very tricky, right? And there's a lot of alpha that could be produced in Burgundy because it's not quite as a, and purposely not quite as established system as, as Bordeaux is. So I'm curious how you guys would would give advice to to building out that portfolio and how you almost tranche out that portfolio of what's what's tried and true, what are you taking flyers on, what's you know a little bit in between? Yeah, so uh, again, I'll start with your your objectives and your risk profile. Um, and then from there, we'll build your portfolio. Um, if it's a if it's a million dollar portfolio, 
you can be very diverse and and just like any other asset manager we preach diversification for all of the the reasons that you know we all know from brinson and 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 others um so when you look at uh if you go on the livex website you can actually see their sub sub indices for each region and you can see you know how each region has performed and say over the past five years and and you're absolutely right you'll see burgundy kind of going like this right it was it's had remarkable growth um in price and um the dispersion between burgundy and uh you know when you get down to let's say rome or rest of the world is actually pretty meaningful um and so you know again we we believe that you'd have to have a diversified portfolio by region um and then based on your objectives again you you'd probably have your core of uh first growths and you know if we can acquire uh, Grand Cru Burgundy at uh, a reasonable price um, and in the volume that uh, you would need, you know, to to meet um, uh, those those size portfolios, then obviously you would hold that too. Um, so, yeah, so, you know, there'd be a careful construction of it and um, it, we wouldn't we wouldn't deploy it all straight away because of the, the amount. Um, and so what we would probably advise you to do would be um, let's do a essentially a drawdown you know where it will we'll, we'll build the first three four hundred thousand build the next three four hundred and then and then draw the rest down to complete your portfolio um so that that's sort of the approach we would take there how do you think about like vintage dispersion and so we talked about futures but i'm sure you're buying a lot of stuff at auctions or buying private sellers so then it, as you're deploying that capital how are you thinking about uh you know providing different vintages across the different regions and then and then how are you actually acquiring those vintages for the client. Yeah, we, um, one of the things that we are very good at, um, and we talked a bit about futures, not this year, but last year, we were the second biggest uh, Bordeaux futures buyers in the UK because it was outstanding value. Um, so we have a very large buying program um, and really deep relationships with a number of producers. And so, our first objective is to access as much wine as we can directly from producers uh, for two reasons. One is obviously price. The second is provenance, right? So the closer you can get to the producer in, in where you're acquiring your wine, the less the chance that there's gonna be uh, an issue of fraud, which unfortunately in the wine industry is, as we all know, is an issue. Um, so we we try firstly to secure our wine there. Next, we'll go to negotiants. We'll go to um, agents that are reputable and, and essentially, you know, just one step from the producer. Um, and and that's where we try to source most of our wine. Then we'll source some from reputable, um, as I said, reputable mer merchants, which might be one step even further from the agent. But um, uh, we do very little. Um, I, I, in fact, I don't think we do any auction buying, um, and we do very, very little uh, and only if we can, you know, guarantee the authenticity of, of what we're buying, because obviously it's it's important. We can't afford to have a fraudulent bottle, um, and and you know, knock on wood, um, we we've, we've managed nine hundred and fifty thousand bottles. Uh, over 14 years and not one complaint or one instance of fraud. So, um, you know, we want to keep that, uh, keep that going. Uh, and if, if, if it ever happened, our policy is we, we'd replace the, the wine for you or credit your account at, at the value if, if it can't be replaced. So that, that's our approach. Yeah. People have no idea, like the idea, um, how much fraud is, is rampant in the wine industry. Mike and Rodrigo, I'm sure you guys would love some of those documentaries on like Rudy Carneal and everything. Sour like, grape. Sour yeah, grape. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. But I told you, you basically have to have a team that's going in to check like the authenticity and provenance of those bottles. And are they checking fills, paper stock, ink? I mean, that it, it becomes, I, I would think the larger part of your business is actually authentication, right? Which is why we don't do a lot of transfers in from private sellers or, um, you know, or, or, or merchants that we don't don't really know or haven't done all our due deal on because it's just it, you're right it's overwhelming um the uh we do have a team at the um at our storage facility 
which is, it, it, you might be familiar with this, Jason, is there's a, an independent third party called um, London City Bond, and they operate 2 million square feet of um, warehousing for alcohol in the UK, 8 million cases. So there are independent third party storage facility. We have 24,000 square feet there. And so um, together with London City Bond uh, staff or reps, we have our own people too. So if, if there was going to be any sort of wines coming in that we thought, um, you know, didn't immediately pass our, you know, our strict screen, then we go into that mode where you'd have to really, you know, look at them all, like you say, uh, check the fills, check the uh, labels, and uh, you know, uh, unlike in the uh, the Rudy uh, Kernawan case where he got busted because he he forged some wines that were never made, um, you know, you you have to otherwise, do that too. He a, <laughs> otherwise, he had a great business. <laughs> he would have just not said that he made a wine that never was made by a producer that didn't exist in that time frame if he would have just not see bright he would still be printing wine but by the way which is not easy to fake no, you no, know a 2000 yeah. bordeaux that's not an easy thing to fake no it, it should be a winemaker like, with that nose and that palate that he was able to recreate he should be just be a oh, winemaker without a doubt like except he could have been a wine critic could have done anything if you can fake people out for that amount of wine and with the meticulousness of finding the corks finding the bottles the bottles have to be right like you were talking about earlier jason the ink the the font like yeah. everything has to be perfect and and then the wine has to sort of taste the kind of like what the the actual wine is like it has to sort of taste like a whatever from that era you know Bordeaux. i think or notwithstanding you gentlemen and your fine palate I get recognition that the vast majority of quote unquote wine connoisseurs have no idea what they're talking about or doing oh, right like no question it's, you can it's sell virtue signaling. you can sell to 90 percent of the market that claim to be amazing at knowing what a good wine versus a bad wine is in reality they're just posing so i'll just i'll just say what everybody here is thinking all 150 watchers of this podcast right now <laughs> <laughs> um mike and rodrigo i'll let you guys handle because I have, I have a million questions but i don't want to yeah, i don't want to monopolize the questions oh, okay can we, ask, can we ask jason yeah, some questions it. Oh no! Please yeah. don't. I, I prefer asking <laughs> questions to answer. Yeah, them. no. Tell tell us about your uh, your girlfriend and her as a sommelier. And did you guys watch uh, Psalm all of the movies together? Uh, yeah. Are you yeah. With one of what, like those guys uh, with wine or? Yeah, so I've seen all the Psalm movies, and we actually we pretty much we know the director, the producers, all of the, all the guys that were in the films are all good friends of my girlfriend. So all right. Um, yeah. yeah, so we know we know all of them very well. Um, she's been wine director at multiple restaurants. And you know she, she, you know she's deeply ingrained in the industry. She probably knows vintage Napa wine better than probably. There's probably only a handful of people in the world that teach as much vintage Napa You're wine. Right. Can as you she uh, has. can you put the mic down and get your uh, your girlfriend here, please? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. And then uh, and then she branched out recently, and I know Rodrigo loves this. She branched out more, and it does a lot more um, Instagram and YouTube content, and um, almost like you're saying is like. As people, as we had to look for different um, trust agents than Robert Parker, you know, that has changed the field dramatically and you had the different magazines that were produced, but now you're seeing it much more on Instagram and social media to find your trust right. agents. And so she's becoming that way. So we actually get caseloads of wine shipped to our house daily that they're hoping she'll review. So we're like, you know, oil traders in, in, in late 2020 where we're just overwhelmed with wine every day. And everybody's like, oh, great, just send it to me. And I'm like, do you know how much it costs to ship wine? It would be better for me to just pour it down my drain. Like it's ridiculous, but like so we have a we have a we have a great problem to have in our house. We have way way too many wine too many wines to drink. I mean, I think there's at least a, a dozen that are open on the on the table next to me. So that's that's the world we live in. Um, but I was getting more. It's, it's, it's Saint it's Saint Bavant, right? Yeah. Give great yeah, shout on. out. I appreciate that. She's on. Oh uh, yeah, she's, she's on right now. She, <laughs> she's <laughs> right. she's dialed in, bro. No, Some now I'm embarrassed. With us. <laughs> now I'm embarrassed. Uh, I love the it. Only... Hey, check check out Samba Vaughn, everybody. She's. she's I'm gonna. She's I'll, just... I'll Instagram as soon as I'm off this uh, webcast. <laughs> great. And then my my personal history is actually um I actually used to work as a as a as a lowly sommelier, more like a a. Uh, a cellar rat way back in the day and I owned restaurants and everything. But 
Um, my knowledge base of wine is maybe, you know, it's greater than probably 90% of the general public, but it's maybe only 1% of what my girlfriend knows. And that's what people don't realize is like, there's really levels to this game. And the best advice I can ever give anybody, and I'm sure you guys would concur, is like, when you're at the restaurant, just ask the sommelier. They're they're happy. They want to make your experience the best possible. They're not there to rip you off. It's no longer these old white dudes that are really pretentious and trying to screw you. You know, there's a whole new breed of sommeliers that are just trying to give you the best experience at the best price point you can get. And just ask them for their advice. They're going to know way more than you know, and they're going to know how to narrow down to exactly what your palate Man, wants. That is such so much better advice than grabbing video and taking like yeah. 27 pictures of, like, of the menu <laughs> until I figure like maybe a four star I can put in. Like it's it's quite embarrassing. We're like, are you ready? No. Well, just looking at the four star wines that, that might my, be on your menu. My advice is it is intimidating though. Blunt, but be blunt with the sommelier. In, yes. in the sense right. that you have a budget. I yes. am willing mm -hmm. to spend a hundred to or a hundred and twenty dollars tonight and I like blah blah blah. So for me, I like wine with age on it. I would prefer a lesser wine that's got more age. Um, I do not like wine from the cradle. I'm not a huge fruit bomb guy. I want it to have at least matured. I want something at least in its adolescence, which is hard, depending on where you are, can be very mm -hmm. difficult. In Ontario, it's actually really hard to find appropriately aged wines at restaurants without having to actually give up an arm or a leg. And But then at, in other places, it, it actually is quite achievable. So if I'm going in and, and it's a, a wine cellar that I'm, or a restaurant that I'm not familiar, there's a couple tricks I have. One is look in the magnum section there's always magic in the magnums right if you have a group of four or six people make sure you look in the double bottles they sell less they turn over less so there's a lot of times there's a little bit more age on the bottle and you actually usually get a slight deal on that second bottle so if the bottle's retailing at 100 and it's going to be 200 for that for the magnum you get it for 175 it does age slower in a magnum too um but that's how you, know, you got me into you're... wine 11 years ago. Do you remember that, Mike? Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. I, I remember? Oh, my I... God, Buck, we got to <laughs> tell that story. Too. Wait, wait. So, so, yeah, you know, so we just partnered up. The tip on the tip. Yeah, yeah. You go in, you say to your Somalia, my price tonight is 150 I like something yeah. with more age on it. Send me, where, where should I be looking in this in this wine book? And they will help you. Yeah, before you get to, to before Rodrigo, Rodrigo gets to his story, though, Mike is saying excellent advice, but even more importantly, like, if you're in a business group or whatever and you don't want to say that price out loud, they're amazing. The sommeliers are Sherlock Holmes, right? All you have to do is point to a few wines you're looking at. That gives them the hint of the price range. They get it. And you point to the wines that you prefer. They also get your palate then. Like I remember my, my girlfriend, when she comes to the table, she's basically, she like Sherlock Holmes and she's asking questions like, what hotel are you staying in? You know, she's looking at the watches yeah. that people are wearing because a watch tells a lot about you and all those things. So she's like, she's slowly sleuthing down that 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 funnel to try to narrow in this person because she wants to have a good time. And like Mike's saying, if, especially on the Magnum list, um, you know, there's a lot of stuff on there that maybe they're not moving. So if you get to know that sommelier and they like you, they're going to hand sell you that bottle and they're likely to give you a discount or a deal on it because they want you to have a good time. And they also want to turn over their seller. And with that, Rodrigo, I'm sorry, you can get to the, the no, I just, one, last thing, one last yeah. thing on that. There's nothing that does a restaurant more good than a magnum on a bottle in the in the table of the restaurant, right? It gets everybody else looking for magnums. Yeah. So look you at do it, one magnum party. that night, you have that on the table. <laughs> they're like, yeah, they got a magnum. You should get a magnum. And all of a sudden, they're rolling through some stuff. So, I mean, some of it's an experience. You're having something special. And if you've got four to six people, you're going to go through two bottles anyway. And there's nothing that sort of represents a nicer time and more more specialness to the event than than doing the magnum size. And then right. I remember introducing Rodrigo to wine, and he we were sitting at this place, good Italian restaurant, and he said to me, he's like, I'm I'm ordering some wine, and he's like, Why would anybody ever pay more than twenty dollars for a bottle of wine? I <laughs> will never do that. And I said, I will bet that that is false. And it's not only false, but it's false within this year. You will order a <laughs> bottle of wine. <laughs> it was within the week. I ordered a nice Amarone that afternoon. A Magnum. We sitting at a, <laughs> a Magnum of it. it was and I was like, oh, my God, Amarone. I've never <laughs> tasted anything like this before. Right? And this is like, I was fairly young then, still, you know, early in the career. Went to the restaurant. 
with my wife. I'm like, I'll, t- I'll take an Amarone. I'm like, that'll be $250. I will take a Rioja. <laughs> <laughs> um, but today's, today's actually my anniversary. I'm taking my wife to a restaurant. So I should take off my Timex uh, sports watch and borrow Mike's. I don't know. What do you got, Philip Mike's? Patek. Philip throw your Philip Patek on. Probably throw on JP's Rolex. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> well, These are actually, actually because I've I never actually, 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 actually used it. Timex is actually the right thing for you to wear there. Actually. Exactly, it's the right thing. It tells about your personality, and that helps you figure out, them figure out your palette, right? It's all it's all connected. All those aesthetics are connected. I told, I'm curious, like though, you know, we talked about you know buying this as an investment, but let's let's be honest, we're talking about the enjoyment, and the enjoyment is the biggest part of it. And I remember back in the day, we used to have a heuristic like decades ago that basically buy a three pack, right? Sell one, flip it, you know, make some money back, sell another one and drink the third one, right? And that that's maybe a per- terrible heuristic for the way you guys do it. Uh, much more sophisticated now. But I remember there was also these firms back in the day in like Luxembourg where they would sell your wines for you, but they would have like quarterly meetings. These were more funds and they would pop the bottles like in, in this, um, in their wine cavers, it was actually inside a bank vault but it was also for the enjoyment uh, on a quarterly basis. So, you know, I know you guys are giving the investment advice and you're talking about bonded warehouses and, and on shipping, you got to worry about the bottle shock, but how do, how do the, how do you suggest the customers really enjoy that wine? And I assume you're also saying, Hey, this is your vintage range. This is the time to be drinking this if you want to actually consume it. Yeah. So we, uh, again, since the clients own their wine, um, uh, as I mentioned, you know, it, it, it's open to anybody to, uh, to take possession of their wine. Um, there are some complications, obviously, in, in jurisdictions like Canada, where you, you, know, you have to do it through your, your local liquor board, and, and there are, you know, taxes of, um, that are applied that might make it not worth doing. Um, but that said, uh, historically, what we have found is 80% of the wines uh, are investments, and so they get sold, um, clients will either redeploy or, or take proceeds. 20% our clients will take possession of. So, um, you know, so people are enjoying the wines. Like you say, there, there's, um, we like to say there's two parts to this. There's, there's the head and the heart, right? The heart is that it's the romance of wine and, and we love wine. I mean, you know, we wouldn't be doing this if we, we didn't. And a lot of our clients do as well. So there's that, that romance of the wine and, you know, drinking an amazing uh, wine that's been bought from the producer and cellared perfectly, and you've got your original wooden case, right? That mean that that's a great experience. Um, but the other thing that we do is we um, we do provide those experiences for clients as well. So you know, we'll put on tastings. We'll um, uh, in in a number of our global offices. So so we have six offices globally and. Um, uh, around 80 people um, in in the company, and so you know we'll we'll have um, uh, we we do wine education, so we'll host uh, W set classes, and we get a number of people you know signing up and and um, uh, being part of uh, learning more about wine, and and we do trips uh, for for clients, and uh, hopefully when you know uh, we can all take more of those trips. Um, uh, we'll be able to do more of those. So um, I'd say, uh, sorry, just make sure my laptop's plugged in here. Uh, there we go. Um, you know, I'd say that historically the company started out more as a pure asset management shop, and I and we haven't done as much of the the heart part uh, that that um, that maybe we we could have and should have. But that is something that we're now focusing more on, and we have a we hired um, a customer experience. CX individual who now has uh, two people on his team. So um, as as we kind of keep growing and expanding, really in North America, you know, we spend more time on this on the CX part of it. Um, and uh, just just a last point there is uh, we're in the middle of a, a refresh of our our branding, and and in September we'll roll out uh, a whole new website that that'll be a lot more user friendly, and we will have. A, a, a you know good portion of it dedicated to education, um, so you'll be able to go on there and and read about you know producers and wines and and some of those other wonderful things us wine people love to do. So uh, you're absolutely right because because they do go hand in hand. So so let me pull on that thread and I'm gonna I'm gonna read something out loud because I think it's an interesting point of view. You have 
the way I see it is, think about the world of investing stocks, right? You have the value managers, which are the managers that everybody respects and intuitively believes that are going to tell you, I'm going to find really undervalued stocks and companies that are going to grow when they're undervalued, whatever. You see the guys buying Tesla and everybody makes fun of them because they have no value. They're not making any money. They're constantly using their total frauds. And yet one is massively outperforming the other, right? And what you're describing to me is a lot of value investing. But from what I understand with, with Parker and his point system, I'm going to read something that Raul Pal wrote as, as part of a, of a string, just a couple of points here. He talks about how this is a story of a man's palate and his scoring, how his scoring system changed the world of wine and globalized wine styles. Um, you, so this is, uh, oh, sorry, this is the wrong one. So he says the U.S. became the greatest, the biggest wine market in the world as Parker had made it easy to understand wine, but his palate changed wines forever and wines became standardized to it in order to get the famous 90 score so they would sell with big dollars. And the world of wine began to get distorted by these super big high alcohol wines that were stripped of terroir, terroir, ter terroir, 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 <laughs> terroir. Yeah. And, were walk, fruited, yeah. Yeah. and were fruited on overripe wines. You see, no one had a choice not to change their wines. So do, do, you, like, do those sell better and make more money? Than, and, and those may be something good for your investment side of things, but not for your heart? Like, how yeah. do you? <clears throat> Everybody's palate is different, right? So... Um... I uh, I don't know if we're going to talk about the wines we're drinking uh, today, but uh, I, I I favor Burgundy. So I've got uh, right now a 2002 uh, Charme Chambertin by the Drouin family, uh, who we know, uh, we, we know quite well, and, and uh, Ooh, the lovely the family. <laughs> um, and that that's my taste. Um, you know, I love Pinot Noir. I love um, uh, elegant wines that are balanced and, and like Mike with some age on them. Um, but other people love the big, uh, you know, like call it a big uh, fruit, fruit bump. with a lot of jam. Um, and that's okay too. I mean, you know, everyone's got a different palate. To answer your question, um, you, obviously, Mr. Parker, you know, again, when you wield that kind of influence uh, or, and, and dominance, Look, I mean, produce. It's a business, right? So producers want to get those, mostly get those high ratings. Not everybody. A, a lot of producers will just say, "Look, I make the wine I make, and I'm going to market and sell it the way I want to make it, and and that's great." Others may say, "Well, you know, uh, obviously I got to pay the bills, and I need a, a high rating, and and if a, a certain critic has a certain palate, I'll make my wine to their taste, so I get a good score." Um, that, that, you know, that's part of, uh, that's part of, uh, what, what we're talking about in terms of, uh, inputs into, uh, decision-making on investing in a wine or not investing in a wine. I think again, the fact that now that there are many recognized, uh, critics and, and as, as Jason pointed out, you know, with his girlfriend and others on Instagram and otherwise, um, you know, people are, um, consuming advice about wine in a different way, uh, which, which I think is, is terrific. Um, and uh, so, you know, a roundabout way maybe of answering your question, uh, there was also a very famous um, uh, wine, I'll call it a consultant. And if you ever saw, it's really hard to, in Canada, it's hard to, uh, to see it again, but there was a, a documentary called Mondo Vino, um, re really interesting. Uh, a documentary and, and Jason it's seemed phenomenal. Like, yeah, it, it's really good. Um, it, it's not on any of the, the services in Canada right now, so I've been trying to, to rewatch it, but I'm sure in the US uh, you, you can see it. Um, really interesting. Uh, and, and they do, you know, have a, a feature on Michelle Roland, who is uh, the, this famous wine consultant who would, in fact, go and um, consult with wineries to create a wine that uh, you know could potentially get a higher critic score. Um, and, and he was called, I think, the flying winemaker because you know he'd be 
flying all over the world with you know Chile, Argentina, Australia, France, and and consulting with all these wineries to create wines that would get high scores. Um, so you know that that happens. I, think, I, think I, I told just took like half the things I wanted to say about it. Also, <laughs> I'll start off with too is um. I'm drinking the Okoda from Australia, and this is actually just a field blend of both reds and whites, and it's actually a natty wine. And normally, I don't even like natty wines, but this one's delicious, and okoda has been making, it's a very small producer in Australia that's great. But to, I want to touch on a bunch of things that, that was just said, especially with Parker, right? Is that, by the way, Rodrigo, um, Raul and I were on the same podcast talking about Parker and the Parkerization of the world. And we have differing right. views, right? Like, like to me, um, what's very fascinating to me is, you know, Parker came out of this idea in the 1970s, Nader's Raiders, right? And he wanted to actually really help the consumer because at the time, wine wine was like a cabal, right? That And it was really, you know, it was difficult to break into. So that's kind of the 100-point scoring system was he was trying to democratize wine, right? And then, that, unfortunately, then that metric can get abused. You know, as, as we all trade volatility as well, it's like when vol becomes a player within the markets as well, it can it can distort the market, so to speak. But I also, I don't, I don't think it's prudent to hate on Parker because honestly, he brought so many people to wine. It's like, it's like if I wanted to hate on Starbucks, right? Because I actually drink third wave coffee that's, you know, very specific producers. But without Starbucks coming in, I would have never had the third wave producer. So I'm thankful for Starbucks. And so I'm also thankful for Parker because it brings more people to wine. And yes, a 100 point system could get distorted. And I, I was going to bring up Michelle Roland too and his micro oxygenation and everything. But basically, it got it got to a point, yes, where at, at the high end, everything was built around Parker's palate. And it's not Parker's fault, per se. You just became, you know, the 800 pound gorilla. But the best part is like now this has become very dispersed again. But the best best part is even if that does happen, all of the value and the good stuff is always on the periphery of life. Right. And so you need the experts like Atul and his team or other sommeliers or different people in the industry is if you don't like Parker's palate. Great. It shows you the wines to stay away from. And then you can search out these hidden gems and likely the price point is going to be lower. To Raul's point, Raul loves vintage Riojas. Well, because Parker didn't love them, he can still get a deal on a vintage Rioja. So it's just like everything in the world has it has trade-offs as we all deal with on a daily basis in our investment portfolios. Yeah, I mean, I got into Riojas because at the time it was all I could afford and it's the only thing I liked. Right. And it's always it was interesting to see Raul talk about how undervalued the Rioja was because it gets no love. And yeah. it's amazing. It's like you can yeah. get you can get a Rioja for, for something that for, for like half the price of what you would get for something that's similar tasting in a popular, you know, uh, for, place for me, like for me on the Riojas, it was it was always about the age. Right. The Riojas often aren't even released for sale until they're five to seven years old in in sort of more traditional outlets especially in ontario right so you're either going to have a, s a seller in ontario and you're going to be buying and aging um or if you're going to try and buy something off the shelf from vintages you're going to have a narrow selection and you you know a lot of what's going to have age on it will be a rioja type spanish wine tempranello or something like that so that that's why i like them because it prioritizes my sort of you know sort of less fruit bomb more you know sort of aged wine that, that has a little bit of that um acidity falling off and gives some of the, the smoother um textures and flavors but it's yeah. uh very interesting yeah um, so, um, i'm i'm well, picturing adam in traction in the hospital bed but adam is asking he's in, what are the care what are the yeah. carrying costs on wine as far as like, on the investment side as far as fees storage you know, it's spoiling, well, as cetera, long as like, as long as it's not near Adam's house, like if if <laughs> Adam has a wine cellar within his reach, that is just a yeah it's a serious serious <laughs> negative carry on that. <laughs> what happened? It was spoilage, honey. Spoilage. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. But so it's true, it's true. Talk about that, and then and then I think yeah. it's that's probably weaved into that is the is the actual a beta that you get or the expected excess return that you were receiving right. minus those things. So maybe talk about that whole sure. complex. Why would, why would wine increase in value? Is it stored, et cetera, et cetera. Anyway. <laughs> uh, sure. I will. Uh, so of course, you know, being asset managers, we go hey, historical performance obviously is an indicative of future performance. That said, um, October 09 is when cult wine started maintaining records of um, its uh, its its own index. So in other words, an aggregation of each client's portfolio because they're all they're all 
tailor-made and bespoke so you can't run you know a, a, an index as you would like an s p 500 for example um so that said uh, the the annualized average annualized return has been 12 percent in canadian dollars um per year since october 09. Um, so from that you subtract essentially um it, there's a long explanation here but the way we will will describe it is about three percent per year if you hold a position for five years um and and at higher investment levels it will be lower but on average we'd say three percent so you know you'd say essentially you could expect 12 minus three nine percent on average um if the historical rates of return continue so you have an opportunity to outperform uh equities but we don't start our discussion with return because like a lot of real assets there are a, a lot of great benefits uh, beyond return to your portfolio. So I won't go into all the details, but um, basically uh, there are very low correlations to equities, low volatility with wine, obviously the basic economic principle of supply and demand uh, works very well because only 1% of the world's wines are considered investment grade. So obviously as time goes on, consumption and demand uh, drive prices up. Um, and then the last really great um, uh, fact that, that, I, that I find really good is the, the low downside capture. So in other words, when equity markets go down and crash, wine goes down, but not nearly as much. And, and you can show goes down that. down the gullet. Yeah, yeah. You can show that in, uh, in, in the LiveX indexes. And, and you just take the year 2008, for example, S&P 500 was down 38%. The LiveX 1000 index was down 4%. So that's kind of the buffer that uh, an investment in, in a, an alt like wine will give your broader portfolio. I, I'm curious though, along that line, what, what's kind of worried me recently is that obviously we can study, you know, look back centuries to see the returns on, on fine wine and real assets. Um, and especially some, some great studies that came out recently showing like the last hundred years, like you're saying wine is almost outpaced on any other asset class in real terms. Um, but I wonder when we're looking at that past back test, it ha has times changed? Like almost like, you know, part of that is we're looking at it like from a PE perspective, right? The illiquidity, they don't have the mark to market. So that's buffering the volatility. But as, as times have changed and we become, we start building out these funds where you can invest in wine or we start fractionalizing wine shares, we create a futures market, we yeah. we create all these ways to access real assets. Like I think about even in the art market with like things like Masterworks, where you can buy fractional pieces yep. of art, yep. is we've actually trained, changed these things from real private assets that had a lack of granularity to fractionalized investments that we can trade in fractions of a second. Is Do we almost have to throw out the last 100 year back test when we think about these real asset classes? Well, you would you would hope that uh, the increased interest is just going to drive up demand, um, and and again, in the short term, right? In short term, but it might increase volatility as well. It may. You're you're right about that. I mean, one of the one of the one of the reasons why wine doesn't drop nearly as much when when equity markets crash is because if you look at the profile of the investors or holders of wine, they're not likely to be panic sellers um and and they don't need the that. liquidity right and we know that from our client base right um we know that when the equity markets are down they just go fine i got my wine i, I don't have to sell it i don't need the cash um and so uh, a lot of the the private clients in in the in the wine world uh people who build their own sellers or invest with companies like us are going to be people who generally can withstand uh those short-term you know uh, short-term plunges, let's say. Uh, there's not a big institutional um, trade, if, if you will, in wine. So you don't see the hot institutional money, you know, flowing in and out. Um, and at the end of the day, uh, it's still wine. In other words, it's it's wine. If you're, if you're going to do it properly uh, without a synthetic way to, to get the returns, you need to have the wine um, so it's a physical asset right um, so so it's a, it's an interesting point a very good point um, because you're right there are uh, platforms now where you can uh, where you can own fractional shares of wine um, and uh, and then 
uh, we've also seen a couple of essentially robo type advisors um, coming up uh, w who are taking more of a technological approach to wine investing. We like to think that we're more of a traditional asset manager as opposed to kind of, you know, running it with algorithms. Uh, although we do use algorithms, we also have a, a human fundamental uh, approach. Is it through well. NFTs or just a platform that offers fractionalized exposure? Um, it's a platform that oft I can tell the, you know, the name is called Rally. Um, so if you look up yeah. Rally, uh, and and in all fair disclosure, we actually uh, provide some of the wine for their engines. So uh, just to be clear, uh, we're friends, <laughs> um, and uh, it, it's a really interesting platform. So uh, they fractionalize trade, sports cards. Um, you know, I, I don't know if yeah, Michael right. Jordan sneakers, but. Uh, uh, all kinds yeah. of collectibles, and and uh, when I was on there last week, my my kids are crazy dinosaur fans, and I saw there was a, it was a fractional ownership of a triceratops skull, and I thought, you know, that's really cool, but and I, I'm not sure if they're going to appreciate the fractional ownership. They, they'd rather have the actual <laughs> triceratops skull, I'm sure. But uh, yeah, yeah, Rodrigo, that was exact. I was exactly thinking of Raleigh. Uh, rally, sorry, and, and what you brought up though with NFTs is like, I was trying to hold off in this episode talking about crypto at all, but I want to get that in there for your views. So that that way, yeah, but you got to say crypto, that way your view count goes up and that way it's virtual. So, but it, it, it is interesting how the ideas of, of crypto or blockchain or something along those lines can really help with this issue of provenance in wine. And, and so one, it can help you with that traceability and tractability. Now, granted, you have a problem when you're when you're converging from a real world asset to on chain, you have an Oracle problem that makes that slightly difficult. But what I think is even more fascinating that people aren't talking about as far as the, the NFT route is part of NFTs when they're released is that you can have follow on royalties. And so when you have these people that are actually producing these cult wines and they're saying selling it on for $500 a bottle and five years later you see collectors that are flipping that for 5,000 a bottle, they've missed out on all that appreciation. Right. But now you could tokenize it where they had 10% royalties so as it gets sold five years from now or 50 years from now, they're increased, they get a, a royalty stream from actually creating that cult wine. And I think that's really fascinating from the producer level. That's that's a really neat point. Uh, just a couple things on that. So we do invest heavily in technology. We've got data science teams. Um, we have seven proprietary models that we run with all those factors that we talked about, you know, uh, price, price ratings, changes, climate, all kinds of things that inform our investment decision uh, making process, right? Um, and uh, we actually did an NFT uh, that uh, I think closed last week or the week before. And what it was was um, uh, it was um, it was um, uh, an opportunity to buy a barrel of Chateau Angelus, um, and uh, the people were bidding on it, and they would get the whole barrel uh, bottled um you get a trip to the the winery and have a dinner with the producer um and and uh there was a uh, an artwork commissioned as well um that went with the uh, the nft that was purchased um so it is kind of neat wow uh, that's as, so cool as that's far as so i know cool. yeah oh it, it is cool as far as i know i think we were the second i'm not sure but i think we were the second um out there to do an nft because i think actor did one with um Ligier bel air a, 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 an awesome producer out of burgundy um so you know we're, we're kind of putting our we're starting to put our toes into some of that um i can say that we're currently blockchaining our inventory so um there's a number of reasons why this is going to be really helpful uh, to our operation uh, one being for example um, because you own your wine and it's segregated, it is all held separately and marked in your name at the storage facility. So if you as a client, so if, if Jason wants to sell Rodrigo a case and you're both clients of ours, that's great. But we now have to go and forklift all the cases on top of it off, get that case, find Rodrigo's area and, you know, put the case there. That's what you have to do. If you can blockchain that, you're already saving a whole bunch of time because you just ledger it. Um, and Jason, to your point, ultimately we think and we feel that we hopefully can get to where um, you're you're blockchaining it right from the producer. And and that you're absolutely right. F fraud, you, you can't say that it won't ever happen, but it's going to be a lot harder. 
uh, for sure. When you've got records of where it was, what temperature it was stored at, how it was moved, who owned it, who owns it next, like, um, you know, that that's going to help. Yeah, you could even implant, yeah, chips to even think about humidity and temperature levels on storage capacity. That, yeah. that would be yeah. fascinating too. Is that, are you using like the IBM Hyperledger to figure out, is that the blockchain you're using to, to figure out store, uh, you know, the client's portfolio not, allocations or what do you? Yeah, it's not IBM, but um, but uh, there are some, there's some, there's some uh, good, good ledgers out there and, and um, uh, you know, probably can't say too much more on it right now. Yeah, but, uh, that's, right, that's, right, that's right. But Rodrigo, if you think about it, like how brilliant is it? Like, I always, I, I think about the analogy of like um, Lady Gaga, right? Wants to create a new album, right? But she's going in studio. It's going to cost exactly money. Right. So she sell, sells each song for a million dollars. And whoever buys it, though, can get a royalty stream off of it. So if you apply that to wine instead of buying the futures, if I'm going to make it and I, I have at least two to three years before I can actually sell it, people can buy a barrel of that and then get the royalty stream. More importantly, like you're saying, you can go get a world-class artist to put the art on their label and they get a royalty stream off of each bottle sold yeah. and in perpetuity yeah, as well. It's, so it's like, crazy that I saw the use case for artists, right? Artists sell their piece and then, you know, a tool, your wife and my wife worked in the same auction yeah, house in Toronto, right. Richie's Auctioneers, right? Yeah. So, you know, the, the world there was kind of interesting because they all had relationships with the artists and their artists were being sold at auction and it was almost sad to see their their pieces go for such high prices that they got zero up right they would get kind of like a benefit that okay my piece sold for x now my new pieces can sell at a higher price but once it's out of their hands they have no they, they, they get no benefit no royalties nothing so i saw the use case for nfts with being able to get that continuous royalty every time they sold i just uh, I, I saw the use case NFTs to fractionalize it, fractionalize wines to allow the masses to participate. But my God, is it so much more enticing if you can get a trip to Bordeaux, and meet the people who made it, and get yep. a you know a little bottle of wine? Like it's just that for sure, a hundred percent is going to make this market and and of course anything that you fractionalize in NFT much more appealing. What a what a yeah, great so to, world. To Jason's question, I mean that's part of the hard part, right? Which is you're getting whatever it is, 220 bottles, let's say, or whatever comes out of a barrel. Um, and uh, and you have dinner with the winemaker one year in, so you try it out of the barrel. That's your barrel. And then uh, two years later, you, you get it. Uh, you can, uh, to, to Mike's point, Mike should have bought it because you can tell them however you want a bottle. You want Magnums, you know, you want D-Mags uh, for a big party. They'll do that. And then you can even, you know, have your own label sort of thing, which is kind of cool, like your name on it. Um, the winemaker so is your Lady Gaga. I never thought of that. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, th there's, <laughs> it's a really neat uh, space. And, and I would say, um, um, uh, for speaking, you know, about cult, I'd say I, I don't think there's anybody, I don't know of anybody else in the world sort of approaching it the way we are, um, which very much attracted me. Uh, to the company because um, you know there's so much that can be done, uh, and uh, with our scale and our our relationships, we feel like you know we we can probably hopefully bring more transparency and trust to the market, um, and and it's very fragmented. So we think there's you know there's some real opportunity to to kind of increase our scale, obviously. Um, but to uh, to Rodrigo's uh, uh, point, uh, Jason, at some point. Your girlfriend and my wife should speak because uh, yeah, my wife was uh, the head of the fine wine department at uh, at, at um, uh, Richie's, and so worked with uh, Rodrigo's uh, wife, which we found out the last time we chatted. Um, but uh, so she's very knowledgeable. She's got an amazing palate, and uh, you know, there's a there's a number of studies. I think you'll you'll be familiar with them, Jason, which will say that in terms of uh, the sexes, women. There's more a higher percentage of women that are super tasters than men, um, and and I, I truly right? believe that. I mean, there are some amazing uh, women who uh, just their 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 tasting ability is amazing, um, and uh, one of the critics who I quite like is is Jancis uh, Robinson, and and you know she'll talk about it and she'll say, uh, you know, I'll be I'll be having uh, wine with sort of the typical uh, older gentleman uh, drinking some old wine. And uh, at some point in the conversation, they'll admit that, you know, their wife or girlfriend is, is a much better taster than they are, despite uh, the fact that they'll talk more about it sort of thing. So it's, uh, it's kind of neat. 
Wow. You, I have no you idea. brought up, you brought up like the bonded warehouses in, in, in England where cult wine started, but like, and you said you had offices around the world. You also work with bonded warehouses around the world. Are you guys storing in multiple countries for clients around the world to get that geographic diversification instead of, you know, any natural disaster risk or anything like that? Yeah. Good question. Um, and, and I'm, I'm kind of, uh, I'm intrigued by that uh, from from a couple of perspectives. One is, you know, obviously we're looking to grow right across North America, and and the U.S. is is a very big market. Um, traditionally speaking, uh, you can store wine obviously in warehouses all around the world. The issue from an investment perspective becomes liquidity. So again, if you're if you're storing in London. And you're selling to Europe. It's a lot easier to, to move the wine. Uh, if you're moving to Hong Kong, it's easier too. Um, if you're in the U.S. and you're selling to Europe or Hong Kong, then then you know you've got to make sure that the wine's being transported properly. And I think the way that generally speaking, the world markets have developed, that's part of the reason why you see um, more wine investment firms in Europe and Asia. But I, my view, personal view, is that if you can create more liquidity within the U.S. market, then that's not an issue, right? If you've got enough buyers and sellers and warehousing um, in the U.S., you should be able to match uh, match more. So it's going to be very interesting, I think, for us as, as we um, look at the U.S. market as to, you know, it, is that something that can be done? It hasn't really been done um, by anyone yet. And so... Uh, I do know LiveX has a representative in the U.S. I, I, I believe they um, have U.S. trading hours, but you know you may need you, you may just need that sort of thing where you need an exchange to facilitate these trades within the markets, so you don't have to worry as much about issues around transportation. Well, and this may this may be too a delicate question, but it makes me think about what Cayman guys on here. But I was wondering, as you're setting those up. Could you basically utilize free ports for storage and bonded warehouses at free ports and kind of avoid international taxation as you're moving your wine around the world? Uh, you know, you I, I guess you could. Um, sure, uh, you, you could because the we got a lot of space in the Gordillo household. Well, <laughs> <laughs> lots of air conditioning in, in, in a hurricane zone. <laughs> Michael, Michael, you're right. I want it on Cayman too. It's a it's a fine zone. I, never get I, I personally don't know uh, of the storage facilities, but I'm sure there's some some good ones that uh, uh, I don't I don't know about them. But I, I guess conceivably you could, but I'm not sure. Well, yeah, I mean, I guess the advantage would be if you're in the Caymans or somewhere else, you could then take it out without taxes. But um, but yeah. So we have a large uh, Cayman Islands audience, the Caymans, and everybody listening. Just, just, we cannot say that the Caymans is. Oh, not, I'm sorry. They, they, they don't. They don't like it here. Do I have to say Cayman? The Cayman. Oh, the Cayman, Cayman Islands is good. Okay. You know, but just you know, the Caymans has a negative connotation after the firm. Got it. That movie. <laughs> that movie kind of ruined it for us. All right. Um, I, won't, I won't make that uh, mistake again. <laughs> so, so well, I suppose the about... idea of a free port, though, is you, you're going to extract it and pay the tax in whatever jurisdiction would have right. that right. tax occur. I mean, if you're coming into a region and that's where the wine's going to be consumed, yep. whatever the tax is, yep. into that tax is in that, in that region, and the free ports just sort of prevent double taxation. <clears throat> Right. Yeah, and the idea too that people are unfortunately treating these as trading sardines and not actually as consumables. So you might want to just be right. moving it around free ports as you, you know, move around the world or adjust your allocations. Well, yeah, and that's the beauty of uh, a blockchain is um, why move the wine. Uh, right. right. You, you, there you, you go. You move the ledger, so that could that be that could be that will be something that's going to be pretty neat for our business, right? Um, and. Uh, if you there are firms out there with digitized, you know, tokenized trading, and, and we're just we're just going to take it one step further. So, so just going back to storage and disasters and losing wines, imagine there's insurance involved. Um, how does insurance work, and does it also cover you for fraud, for like um, yeah um, you know, fraudulent wines? Right. So we use Marshall McLennan, McLennan, um, and it basically covers loss, you know, due to the damage at the facility or, 
um, if the, the, the facility storage was improper, those sorts of things. It doesn't cover um, uh, fraudulent bottles. That would be out of our own pocket. Um, and it doesn't cover, for example, uh, corked wine. I mean, you know, wine's a natural right. natural substance, and so you can't really insure against corkage or, uh, or, or, you know, having storing the wine for too long and it's it's gone past its uh, its drinkability. Well, that's that's not something that insurance will cover. Um, and so, uh, basically, when you look at probably eighty percent of our inventory of three hundred million dollars. Um, they're going to be invested in wines within the last 15 to 20 vintages. So we don't, you know, we don't go out and try to seek the, um, the 1929 Latour or the 47 Cheval Blanc or any of those types of wines. It's just the risk reward isn't worth it there. Um, so that's one way we kind of manage the maturity issue. Um, you can't manage the corkage issue uh, and, um, and and fraud we've talked about how we how we mitigate that i'm just thinking about how much smarter a tool is than the rest of us as 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 uh actively managed funds keep diminishing over time asymptotically you know if you get into the wine business every year is a, every year is a new vintage so it's like you're just re-upping your expertise every year it's just really <laughs> and and also like the, the, what, it, what didn't come to me was the fact that this is it's again like crypto certain cryptocurrencies where it's a supply and demand thing and supply goes down every oh. year, right? Yeah. Like you, you just, totally. it's, it, I, so here's my next question, right? When we uh, resolve um, adds this to their hedge funds for 50% of their allocation, how much Brilliant. liquidity <laughs> can you take, right? What's the, what's the ticket size where you're like, okay, we're gonna need to push this out over a year. And pun intended on liquidity. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's right. So liquid asset. Um, yeah. So basically, our sort of rule of thumb is, uh, if you've got a portfolio that's a hundred to one hundred fifty thousand, we can essentially liquidate that almost right away. If it gets up to about two fifty five hundred, we need probably six to eight weeks. And then if you're talking like sort of in the millions, then you want to ease it into the market. Um, you know, it, it's it's not unlike, um, although there's liquidity in both senses of the word uh, in wine, at the same time, you don't want to have huge market impact, right? So if you're if you're moving a large position globally, everyone's going to know you're moving it. And um, so you want to you want to ease that into the market so that you're not having that uh, uh, the, the market impact that you don't want to have when you're selling. Right. So um, it's a it's a bit of a managed process. Because we have managed portfolios, um, uh, you know, and we do have portfolios that are um, into the millions, uh, but you know, we don't often see, and, and I can't speak uh, uh, for the company on this one because I don't know. Um, I don't think we really see the million, million and a half portfolios where someone says they need to, you know, uh, liquidate right away. For example, um, if you institutionalized it, I think. For us, um, we would think about it in a different way, and that might be to then create the actual investment fund, um, and and then you'd have to have some, you know, uh, some some clear parameters around liquidation, et cetera, et cetera, for really large positions. Right. Okay. Yeah. Um, but uh, but Jason, that your 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 comment is is kind of funny in a way because um, when I was at BMO, I started their ETF business. And at Vanguard, obviously, it, it was ETFs, uh, you know, um, uh, all, all the time, anytime. Uh, uh, and so, you know, I'm a big believer in 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 that approach to your core portfolio, right? Where you can actually, you know, don't try to beat the S and P 500. You can you can do it on asset allocation, but on its own. It's really hard to beat the S and P 500. It, it was. You know, there's some opportunities now with the uh, things that are going on in the tech world. But that, all that said, um, I believe in that in the core part. But um, it, it's really interesting to me because, uh, although, you know, I I definitely appreciate the the um, the the value in active management. Um, obviously, it has to be in a space where you can create that alpha, right? 
I would say your beta should be free, your alpha you should pay for. Um, and I think everybody would be happy to do that. So um, in, in coming into this space, for me, it was, it was really neat because I, I totally get the value of the active because we've got people on the ground in all these regions. We've got relationships with producers. We've got scale. We've got probably more data than, definitely more data than any investment shop in the wine world. Um, and uh, so we kind of feel like there's a, it's an advantage. Um, and, and it's an advantage that we have and there is nothing uh, illegal about that advantage, and and so it's it's kind of it's kind of neat because uh, you're sitting here with all all of these levers, and you're going, this is kind of cool, right? Uh, you do really have an opportunity to to outperform. Wow, it's fantastic. All those and years to convert you into active, eh? Look at yeah. that! <laughs> it does make it does make me think about we should have obviously addressed it at the beginning too. Like when we were talking about first growths and the whole entire growth classification system goes back to the Napoleonic times. And so there's there's like you said there's those five first growths that are like your blue chip that's like your ETFing of the world. But like there's a lot of room for alpha. And so even if we go to like Burgundy to make it more specific, and like you're saying you have Grand Cru and Premier Cru's that are listed, and people can that's kind of your blue chips. But there's a lot of wiggle room in there. That I assume you guys derived your alpha saying these are the hidden gems that we can mm -hmm. find in Burgundy, yeah. and you're a lot. There's a lot better chance of finding them in Burgundy than there is to Bordeaux. Mm -hmm. So how would like your expert staff, like if I just want to, I'm saying, hey, I just want hidden gems, alpha Burgundy. How do you guys assess that market? So that's where that's where um, you know you, you've got producers who were winemakers at great houses, and they've gone off on their own, and they you know they they've purchased some land or they're they're buying the grapes and making their own wine now. Um, and so those are the kinds of producers we like to um, focus on because uh, we know their winemaking skills. We know that um, they're going to be good at selecting their, their grapes if they're buying them or the parcels that they're buying. Um, and it's just a matter of, of time for their wines to kind of catch on and, and, you know, hopefully appreciate like some of the, the Grand Cru labels um, that we that we all know and love. Um, so, you know, that that's that's a bit of what we do, and and that's important um, uh, from the investment an analysis point of view. Where, you know, we have to constantly be on the ground talking to people and and understanding what people's plans are. And um, when you kind of build those relationships over time, then obviously you'll get allocations um, from the producer that are hard to get, um, especially in, in some of these smaller, you know, smaller production uh, producers, right? So um, it's, it's a constant, um, it's a constant business like any other where you're really concentrating on relationships with, with the ecosystem as, as well as with your clients. And in the UK, um, we're actually uh, a registered agent <clears throat> for wine. So over the years, we've developed some great relationships with uh, a number of producers, and, and we will get um, from some of the iconic uh, Italian producers, uh, we'll get uh, an allocation direct from them um, uh, based on what they're allocating to the UK. So we'll get you know, our percentage of that. So that's kind of something that so we, we work on developing as well. Is it like uh, IPOs where the more you, the more business you give, the more business you do, the more access you have? As Great a, analogy. Great analogy. Right. <laughs> uh, yeah, the president's list, you mean? <laughs> yeah, the president's. I haven't heard that in years. Oh my God, yes, the president's uh, list. Yeah. Um, uh, partly, yes. And, and I would say um, things have changed a little bit over the, well, a lot. <laughs> over the last two years, um, even in the wine world, right? Where in the past, um, a, a number of producers obviously would have relied on restaurants and, and hospitality and, and um, air, probably not airlines for fine wine, but, uh, but you know what I mean. Um, places where suddenly they weren't able to distribute their, um, their wine. And so some producers, thought about it and thought, well, maybe I'm a little too concentrated in how I'm allocating my wine to the trade restaurants and otherwise. So what we have found is um, by 
speaking to the producers that we have relationships with, we were able to actually access um, wines that that would otherwise have gone to some of the, the parties in the trade, right? Where we've said, we'll, we'll help you out, we'll take that. And by the way, um, we could commit to doing the same thing for the next X number of years, right? right. So, so we're helping them um, with some certainty and then obviously they're helping us with, with allocation. So um, it's interesting. It, it will be interesting to see kind of how things go once hopefully the world, you know, returns back to uh, some degree of normalcy and, and y you know, a lot of um, French wine got allocated out to French restaurants in France. And, and so when things get back to normal, you know, we're not sure exactly how that'll play out on allocations. But, but I do think a number of producers and agents have kind of recognized the value of private clients um, because they tend to be stickier. They tend to be um, able to buy year after year, um, like we talked about. And so, uh, so it'll, be, it'll, it'll be something that, you know, we'll watch. And actually, Rodrigo, it made me think that maybe the good analogy right now is shipping, right? Shipping containers is like only the tried and true clients are getting allocations of the shipping containers coming across because people are worried about, you know, five years hence, you know, what happens when it comes back down? Like, who's going to actually pay my bills then? So it's like <laughs> the guys that have the relationships are the ones getting the, the shipping containers on, you know, but their, it's always their the products. Case. Yeah, it's always. always, always like, it's always you know, who you know. It's, always it's, who you know it's retail versus wholesale, right? Like it's exactly 100% you're getting better prices. Yeah. Uh, tool, I know you guys, um, sorry, I know you guys, uh, with cult wine starting in, in England, understandably, it's going to be predominantly European focused. But the, at the risk of offending my neighbors here, you guys, uh, especially as you're bringing it to North America, are you guys investing in like Napa Valley cult wines or do you have clients that are looking for those? those and, then, and then I assume you have a team on the ground here to kind of assess those vintages and bottles or? Well, we'll talk offline on that one. Um, uh, <laughs> we do have some some really good relationships with um, some of the iconic cult uh, wines and get reasonably good allocation, which it, which is fortunate. But um, uh, as, it's interesting, and, and I don't know the answer, and I might ask you this, Jason, which is um, traditionally, again, when you look at portfolio allocation and if you um look at even the the livex you know they put they put the us in with rest of the world right which is a small fraction of uh, of the investing world of wine um uh, i i, I kind of have a bit of a a view that um for us to to build out in a bigger way in the united states i i, I believe that there'll be an appetite for clients to see more U.S. wines, so whether it's Washington, Oregon, or, or California, I don't really know New York that well, but uh, uh, there's enough, you know, to choose from there uh, in their portfolios. They'll they'll be just like in securities. There'll be a home bias, right? So my view is, as we kind of build out, um, I, I believe we'll need to develop more of those relationships with producers um, in the U.S. Uh, as well. So one last question with regard to asset management, if you had to go back to Vanguard and create a passive index, what is that? What is that? Cause I, I know you're saying you're an active manager and clearly you're doing a lot of active stuff, but it's almost, it almost feels like, you know, beta, every beta that we know of was at some point alpha, right? Right. Yeah. And it's become like, it becomes either like a, a very easy beta at five basis points or very hard factor based beta at 50 basis points. How do you like? Is there right now an easy beta to access in the world? No, um, there's not. And um, you know, uh, I I don't know. I mean, I guess theoretically, you would think you could synthetically um, create something on the LiveX index, but um, I think it would take some work to structure. And, and obviously, um, I. Yeah, as a market maker, you, know, you you need to figure out how you hedge your exposure, et cetera, et cetera. So I don't know. It, it doesn't it doesn't seem like an easy thing to do, but I mean, there's some really smart people in the world, right? And and uh, maybe someday they will kind of come up with a, a way to do it. But but if you look at like you know gold, for example, there are right. There's two approaches. There's there's synthetic, and then there's actually holding the the bars. Uh, it, it, it's a backup the the fund as well. So um, 
maybe, maybe, maybe there'll be a way to do it. And do you guys charge a performance fee or is it a flat fee? You said 3%, but it's a flat fee, right? No, and I should have mentioned that. Um, we do not charge performance fees. So um, that uh, that's something we don't do. The other thing we don't do is we don't charge any commissions on trading. So when you exit your position, um, we don't charge you anything for exiting. Uh, we, um, you know, obviously our first place to go would be um, internal clients who are, you know, whose portfolio might do well with that wine. And so you match the trade. Um, and then we'd go to merchants and um, uh, uh, traders around the world. So in, in uh, we have offices in Hong Kong and, and Shanghai. And, and so there, there's a really great opportunity for us when clients are exiting to actually sell to um, people who are active traders in those markets of wine. Um, so we do things like that to to minimize the the impact of commissions, uh, we will go on Livex, and uh, but in that case, we eat the commission. We don't charge it to. You. I'm curious, right. like when you're at, from the business standpoint, when you're raising assets, um, especially in COVID, we had a large consumption of wine during COVID. So I was wondering if that was a nice a nice tailwind of you guys raising AUM, and then frequently around here, they talk a lot about you know how do they get the next generation like Gen Z into drinking wine, and I I, I wonder if that's a false conceit, right? It's more of a, it's not just at the age cohorts, it's as we get older, right? And we have a larger asset base and disposable income, we start collecting wine in our old age, not in our young age. So maybe you're going after maybe the wrong demographic. And so are you guys looking with, you know, for people with AOL email accounts or how do you find clients? <laughs> AOL. Um, uh, it's, um, it's mostly, it's mostly direct. It's, it's, um, you know, it's, it's word of mouth. It's our, our trust pilot scores are, are amazing. Our our retention rate is amazing. So uh, basically, when you when you become a client, you're happy. You you like it, and you stay, and you re up as you, as you would say, Jason, almost yearly, right? So it's a nice uh, nice business that way. Um, yeah. So it, it's mostly it's mostly individuals. It's generally emerging high net worth, high net worth, ultra high net worth. Um, uh, that said, we do have a a, a product and I can speak for Canada in September when we do our, our brand refresh, we're going to right now, our minimum is $45,000 for a portfolio manager and, and a, a personal, you know, a person who's going to give you advice, but we're going to roll out a 15 to $45,000 uh, product for that'll be automated. So you'll do your KYC online and, and um, we'll, we'll run your portfolio and rebalance for you. Um, so, you know, our goal is obviously to make it more accessible and, and at those levels we might get um, more early investors, right? Um, so that's um, that's kind of how we view it, but you're, you're, you're right. Um, right now it's, um, it, it, I, I think, I, I don't know the exact average age of our clients, but I know that as a cohort, it's sort of 50 to 60 is the, the biggest cohort. Um, that said, what we're finding so far in Canada and the U.S. is that we're getting a lot more in the 40 to 45 um, age. And so it's a little bit different than Europe, which is which is great. Um, and I think as we roll out our, our lower minimum, then we should be able to drive down maybe the age of, of the investors coming in at that level. Awesome. Well, guys, we're coming up at an hour and a half and Mike hasn't said a word in 45 minutes, which is like... I'm the longest. <laughs> you guys were on I've fire. Ever, I've ever been surprised. looking at Mike where he's remained silent. So, Mike, do you have any, do you have any parting questions? <laughs> None. None. I was taking it in. You uh, you were all over it. I'm like fascinated. <laughs> uh, you know all. You know everything about wine. So I just you know the curious <laughs> mind took over. You guys were on fire. Awesome. <laughs> Well, I, I know from the last time we spoke that that uh, your wine knowledge is is uh, uh, pretty robust as well, Mike. So uh, I, I was surprised you didn't jump in with some zingers for Jason. <laughs> I, I I had I found he's been it, texting I, me about Jason's hat he all said we weren't after. Talk <laughs> over each other. So I'm like, we're not going to talk over each other. You guys <laughs> talked for 45 minutes. I tried to say something. I waited for a gap. It's taken this long. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was fun, guys. Thanks. Uh, uh, th th thanks. Thanks for having me. And uh, it was a pleasure meeting you, Jason. And 
uh, you know, enjoy the rest of the day out in California. It looks wonderful out your window. Yeah. <laughs> Stick around for a post post commercial conversation. Um, <laughs> just, just briefly. Uh, it'll be about 10 minutes. This commercial is coming up. So just everybody <laughs> curved their loins. Um, thank you guys. Uh, Jason, thanks for coming in at such short notice, uh, pinch hitter for, for Butler and, uh, at the tool. Can't wait to see you guys again, whether it were in Toronto, I think Mike, you guys, are you guys going to see each other or not? Cause you're, you're in Maybe Toronto. My huh? schedule is pretty tight on the, on the last weekend there. So I think I'm going to, I'm going to miss him next time. All through, right. let me know. We'll awesome. Do. Thanks so much for your insights, gentlemen. And uh, thank you everybody for sticking around. Thank you. Today's podcast is brought to you by Horizons Resolve Adaptive Asset Allocation ETF, which trades on the Toronto Stock Exchange under the ticker symbol HRAA and is sub-advised by Resolve Asset Management. HRAA is an alternative fund whose investment objective is to seek long-term capital appreciation by investing directly or indirectly in major global asset classes, including, but not limited to, equity indices, fixed income indices, interest rates, commodities, and currencies. HRAA gains exposure to these asset classes by investing in derivative instruments that may include future contracts and forward agreements and securities. HRAA will take long or short positions, using up to a maximum of three times leverage in asset classes such as equity indices and fixed income asset classes, commodities, currencies, volatility indices, and other alternative asset classes. To learn more about this, please visit www.horizonsetfs.com slash HRAA to read about the ETF's investment objectives and important disclaimers about the risks associated with an investment in the ETF.